Earlier this year, Etihad Airways did something it had not done for a rather long time. It turned a profit. Following seven long years of loss-making operations, the airline's long, hard slog towards increased efficiencies and lower costs has finally begun to pay off. Logging profits of almost $300 million on revenue of just under $2.3 billion was due, in part, to a massive increase in passenger numbers, up 300% year-on-year. But it was also thanks to an increased attention on cargo, the agility to identify and target those destinations that would be most profitable to serve, and the diligent targeting of driving down costs at every opportunity. Emerging from the pandemic smaller and with a much simplified fleet, being back in the black at last has given Etihad a major boost in morale and credibility. But there's still a long road ahead if it is to maintain that profitable status, with rising jet fuel costs and economic pressures adding to the headwinds it will need to fly through. Will Etihad seek to grow again in the future? Will new aircraft types enter the fleet? Will its drive to become a sustainable airline bring with it cost burdens that jeopardise profitability? And will the A380, with its wonderful apartment in the sky, ever come back to the fleet? To chat about this and much more, we're pleased to welcome Etihad's Chief Financial Officer, Adam Bukadida, to our webinar today. So I'm here with the Chief Financial Officer of Etihad, Adam Bukadika. I'm sorry if I butchered your name there. Please feel free to correct me. Adam, it's really great to talk to you. Hi, Joanna. Good afternoon. And the name is was nine and a half out of ten, which is very much good enough. So uh, it's great to be here with you. Thank you. And I'm really, really pleased to be talking to you right now because Etihad just did something it's been trying to do for a really long time and posted a healthy profit in what was not exactly the easiest start to the year. So um, what do you think were the main influences that got you back to profit after all these years? So, look, we've been on the transformation for about four and a half years now, um, five years at the end of this year. And, you know, we're extremely proud of all of the hard work that's gone into that full transformation, not just the last one year, six months, or even since COVID. And, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. So, you know, it's broadly 300 million um, US dollars core operating performance, uh, and also close to 700 million EBITDA US dollars performance as well. So staggering where you think we was and the industry was last year. And then if you think where Etihad was, you know, four and a half years ago. So it's down to about four or five key factors, though. So, again, the transformation and the people involved in that transformation is definitely number one. Uh, and again, we've always focused on our cost base. We've always focused on, as you would imagine, from an airline perspective, safety and security. And for sure, and it's been recognized recently, uh, yet again, that we've always focused on the service element for our guests and our global travelers. But the other factors that's also contributed to that is obviously strong travel demand. And for the first half of this year, we flew over 4 million passengers, and that number's significantly higher now as we're looking to close out the, the month of August. So we've recorded 1.2 billion, uh, 1.25 billion, excuse me, US dollars in terms of passenger revenue. And that's a billion improvement year on year. Uh, the, the, the next point is our cargo performance. And again, we, what we've had to do because of the passenger numbers um, increasing on the passenger aircraft, we've had to reduce, obviously, the amount of freight that we can carry. And that was a 19, 19% reduction in capacity. But what we've been able to do, again, is focusing on the yield and focusing on our end-to-end -end operations is a 6% improvement on our cargo performance year on year. So that was an 802 million US dollars. So again, great achievement there. And I suppose on the, the third part of our, of our total revenue is obviously our ancillary, our other revenues, and in particular, our Etihad Guest Loyalty Program. There's a big part of our DNA, not just obviously from a revenue perspective, but a broader sustainability angle, and, and obviously part of us knowing our customers and our guests very, very well. And we saw record numbers of new acquisitions in the month of June, and we've increased to around 8 million um, members globally. So that's a fantastic achievement yet again. I did touch on cost. But obviously, we had a massive increase in capacity, massive increase in the level of ASKs, as we know, 24 billion of those for the first six months of the year. And our direct operating costs rose by about 26%. But 
pretty much all of it, if not 99% of that, was directly correlated with the fuel increase that everyone's fully aware of. Mm. What we was able to do, though, is obviously to continue focusing on the fixed cost base, in particular our administration, uh, our general expenses, and our balance sheet costs, which has been a key part of our financial element of the transformation for the last four and a half years. So cost has definitely played a key part, as well as the revenue. And again, as I started, four and a half years, tremendous work from the Etihad family, and a tremendous achievement of our broader strategy and transformation plan. Fantastic. And I think, you know, for everyone, seeing you guys doing well is such a positive message for aviation as, as a whole. You know, it's it's been a big question. Will people come back to flying? Will the long haul airlines be able to survive? And you guys are very much a long haul operation and you're proving that international is still there. Uh, I guess the business demand is still there. Are you still seeing those premium cabins getting full? 100% is short. So we are very much focused on the full network as a full network carrier focusing on point to point, because obviously Abu Dhabi has so much to offer now. Even if we go back in time for pre-pandemic, which seems like a lifetime ago, so what Abu Dhabi has as a destination is, is, is improved dramatically. But we also obviously focus on our geographical positioning and obviously the transiting passenger network as well. And some of that is short, one hour, four hour, et cetera. And some of that's, you know, back home to my hometown, London, seven hours approximately. And we've got the ultra, ultra um, long haul as well. But to answer your direct question, yes, we're seeing a rebound in all traffic and all passengers. If we look at the moment, you know, at half year, we was above 75% load factor. That number has been exceeded um, for July and definitely for August, which is, a, you know, it's a little bit too early for me to talk about, but no surprise if we're not going to be late 80s, 90% load factor for the month of for the month of August. And we're seeing that across all cabins, but in particular, our amazing premium premium product that we have on our 787 and our A350 in particular, um, which again, you're seeing that both in terms of leisure travel, but also we are seeing a rebound slowly, uh, slowly in comparison to the, the, um, the leisure travel but we are seeing a rebound and increase in corporate traffic yes mm, that's really good to hear and I think you know maybe it's nice that leisure travelers are actually getting to try some of those premium products as well and um, you know we've talked about your transformation plan quite a lot over the years um, I remember when I spoke to Tony a, a year or so ago he said you know you'd taken the opportunity of the pandemic to really accelerate that plan is this a signal that you are finished or you are nearing completion of the transformation plan are you where you want to be I'll, I'll answer the question with a question uh, and then I'll answer the question <laughs> directly <laughs> after. Uh, does change ever finish? Um, and the answer to that is obviously no. Um, what we have been able to deliver is the first part of this um, amazing transformation of four and a half years, soon to be five years. What will then be the transformation and challenge and strategy is to sustain that. And what we're focusing on at the moment, particularly this point in time of the year, is actually to put in place a a uh, strategic plan and strategy that will continue the financial sustainability of Etihad whilst not jeopardizing, as I touched upon a moment ago, the safety, the security, and also the service that we offer. Good to hear. So change is ongoing. Um, I guess that's one of your real positives is that Etihad was, has become a lot more agile. Um, you've also become quite a bit smaller and more efficient in terms of the fleet and the way you operate. Um, do you see a point at which Etihad will continue to scale or will start to grow again? Or, you know, is there like an ideal size that you envision for Etihad in the future? So I think the ideal size is, is, is basically financially driven. Um, and again, we have, you know, from a financial transformation perspective, done a lot of heavy lifting and we are more nimble for sure. We have right sized our network. We have right sized and simplified our fleet strategy. And we've had to make a number of other changes in terms of size and scale and our cost base. But what we're left with now is a much, much fitter, much more agile and a much more sustainable business model and aviation group. We're operating uh, 71 aircraft, both in regards to passenger and cargo, uh, to around 70 destinations. We obviously have a number of seasonal routes that have been great and been completely uh, full over the summer period. And that will definitely continue. So we'll definitely look at where it makes sense to adjust our network. If that's frequency changes to destinations we're servicing, if it's seasonal routes, and just to be clear, if it makes financial prudent sense to do so, we will recommend to our board and to our shareholder that we look at more attractive and more um, additional routes that we may not be happy um, to operate today. 
Thank you. Um, so we talked a little bit about the fleet there. Um, obviously, that's my thing is your planes. I love them very much. I love all planes, but I particularly love your A350. Um, you said, you know, cabins had been full. How has that been settling in? And what's the forward plan for, for these new aircraft? When are you getting some more? Yeah, look, it's a great question. And obviously, there's been some announcements recently that will make it a lot easier for everybody. Um, and look, we've got the 787-9 um, and the Dash 10. And we also had the recently introduced A350 that, that you've referenced. Um, and look, for us, we obviously still do have a narrow body um, network um, to support, which is supported by our, our A320 family as well. Um, and we op operate also uh, freighter uh, aircraft in, in regards to the 777. Um, so for us, look, we've definitely simplified our fleet strategy. The numbers are appropriate for where we are now. And what you will see us do is to work with both our strategic partners, Boeing and Airbus, and obviously the engine OEMs as well, to ensure where it makes sense for us and it makes sense for them and the broader supply chain as we're coming out the back end, hopefully, of COVID, that you will see us bring in the new machines that are going to even improve the service that we're doing today. I'm excited to see the 350 touching more points, certainly. But, you know, your Dreamline is an excellent product as well. Did the lack of deliveries for that long time period cause any operational challenges for you guys? Operational challenges is probably not the right term, but um, using the examples and the, the load factors that I've referenced uh, today in our call, simply put, if we had uh, more 787s, could we fill them? Yes, we could. If we have more A350s, could we fill them? Yes, we could at the moment. But what is more important is that, as again, we don't just look for a quick win. We are very much focused on a medium, long-term strategy here. And again, with our strategic partners, we will make, set, make sure that it makes sense for us, for ultimately our guests, but also for our strategic partners, that we do this in a sustainable manner going forward. Mm. Good to see that Boeing has ironed out that particular challenge and that the Dreamliners are now flying out the door again. Um, but one of the big challenges that certainly we in Europe have experienced, and I think in the US as well, um, this summer is a lack of staff, understaffed airports, causing cancellations, problems with air traffic control. How have you guys fared? Have you, have you seen some of these issues on the routes you operate? So fortunately, not as much as, as many others uh, in summary. And, you know, let me break down that question a little bit. So in terms of staffing, I think it's fair to say the industry is seeing high demand that nobody would have probably expected 12, 18, 24 months ago now. And, you know, one of the things that we've been able to do is to bring back people that was previously part of the Etihad family back into employment. And that's been a great success driven by our HR function here. We are actively recruiting, uh, as most of our peer group across the sector, uh, regionally, uh, but also globally are as well. And in terms of disruptions along the supply chain, again, we're all in the same situation here. But for us, fortunately, we've managed to avoid, avoid a lot of the scenes in airport congestion, in particular here in Abu Dhabi, in our fantastic airport that we have. But for sure, we continue to work with all of our um, outstations, with all of the airports, and of course, with our HR team to ensure that we have the best possible workforce here to support our, our global travellers. Mm, absolutely. And I mean, um, Heathrow in particular has capped what people can fly there at the minute to try and cope with the oversupply of, of passengers. And, and, you know, it's a great problem to have, really. You know, when we were crying out for passengers a year ago, now we've got more than we can handle. But um, are you guys trimming service or, or considering anything to uh, uh, comply with that cap? Not, not at all. Uh, in summary, we've recently moved back to our home in Terminal 4, Heathrow. Um, I was there personally last weekend. It's an amazing end-to-end -end experience. And, you know, we work very, very closely with Heathrow and, and, and many others. And our on-time performance, not just at Heathrow, but across our network, is one of the best regionally and one of the best globally. So we really don't see the, tr the, the troubles there on the, on a, from an Etihad perspective. That's really good to know. And, you know, sticking on the subject of Heathrow, you know, of course, it is a slot controlled airport. And the reason that we were all back in the day ordering the A380 was to cope with these slot controlled airports to maximise the number of passengers we could shift from these big oversubscribed hubs. Um, the A380, I know you said it before, it's not coming back, but I've got to ask you one more time. Is there going to be a point, you've talked about these massive load factors, the high demand, is there ever going to be a business case to bring it back to the fleet? The, the answer is who knows. Um, <laughs> and again, I haven't said today that we're not going to, and I haven't, I'm not going to say today that we're going to. And, you know, you've mentioned a couple of the variables that would make the A380 work for us. 
But I think, you know, we need to step back and talk about the A380 first of all. It is, from a customer perspective, one of the best services, one of the best products that we've got out there. And I'm biased. I think ours is at the top, if not probably at the complete top of the league table, if you look at the product. But the variables that we have to manage in the risk are largely, as you just said, the amount of passengers, the price or yield on the ticket, but also the third one, which you didn't mention, is obviously the cost. Now, you know, fuel, obviously with a four engine heavy, much larger aircraft is a lot more costly than it is to a much more efficient 787 or A350 that's the core part of our, of our fleet strategy. So if it makes financial sense to do so, then for sure we'd look at it. But at the moment, we're not planning to do so. What we are doing and we continue to do is to review the business case on a very frequently basis. Good. So I'm glad to hear that it's not completely written off, although I won't twist your words there. Um, <laughs> and for me, you know, I just want to see the residents back in the sky because nobody else flies anything like that. And I never got to have a go. So, you know, I'd be all for you guys bringing it back. But I do understand the business case has to work as well. Um, so back to the thing that you're really all about, which is the the money and the figures. Is this a sign of continued profitability? I mean, you're talking really good numbers of passengers, good yields, good ancillary revenue. Are you going to post another profit in the second half of the year? And will this be an ongoing trend? So, look, I think for, for, for this, the sector as a whole, it's fair to say that we are seeing a significant demand that perhaps nobody expected. With the, with the continuation of that demand, it is a strong possibility that we will post an even better um, full year performance than what we did for the half year. So at this point in time, obviously coming to uh, the end of August, the end of the summer, it's a little bit too early for me to comment and to, to, to commit to that. But equally, we've had a great first eight months of the year, but obviously there is a, there's a final fur to get through with the final four months. And if we talk longer term, medium and longer term in particular, then the plan is to sustain a profitable business model going forward. So does that mean it's going to be the same levels? It's too early to say for all of the different variables that we're all fully aware of when it comes down to aviation, when it comes down to travel, when it comes down to tourism. But for sure, we're all focused on the next phase of this important transformation for Etihad. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, looking ahead to kind of the next 10 years, what are your hopes for where Etihad will be this time? I don't know, 2032, 2033? Yeah. So, look, it's, it's, it's another great question. And, you know, <laughs> who would have thought that we've experienced that during the last two years, what we have experienced during the last two years? So who knows where we're going to be in 10 years time? <laughs> But what I will tell you is that we will continue to focus on security, safety and, and our service. We'll continue to focus on our employees, on our, on our Etihad family members. And again, we'll continue to focus on providing a end to end, um, flawless, um, sustainable service. Um, what does that look like? It looks like, as I said, a simplified operating model, a simplified fleet structure with a, with a first class attention to detail service. Good to hear. And you mentioned sustainability there. I thought we were going to get through the whole interview without you bringing up um, one of Etihad's biggest buzzwords. You know, it's impossible to talk to Etihad without you guys mentioning sustainability. I know it's such a big part of what you're doing and such a big part of your business. Could you just give us some colour on how your goals for sustainability affect you in a financial perspective? Because there must be a cost to you know, developing SAF to testing these new technologies like you're doing with the, the Green Liner and the, the A350, they call the Sustainable 50. Um, you know, just talk to me a little bit about the cost implications of doing what's right for the environment. So for us, um, sorry to replay your words, but sustainability for us is definitely not a, a buzzword. It's a, it's a key part of our strategy. It's a key part of our DNA. Uh, and it's a key part of our vision going forward. And, you know, that, 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 if we bring that back, that's very much linked to the Emirate of Abu Dhabi and the broader UAE. Um, and we are looking at sustainability every single touch point that we can across our business. You've mentioned some sustainable 50, the Etihad Green Liner. But again, there's many, many others. Um, sustainable finance, if we touch on that briefly, has been a key focus for us over three different transactions over the last three years. 
we've raised approximately $2 billion. And, you know, many of these have been the first for the region, but first for this sector on a global basis. So again, there's financial benefits in looking at that from a creative perspective, but also, again, one of our key strategic pillars is sustainability. So we also uh, benefit from that and doing what is right and everybody should be doing. In terms of sustainable aviation fuel, which you touched upon, uh, Etihad is probably, I believe, the only carrier in the region invested uh, into the production of SAF, as you mentioned. And again, that goes back to our key um, focus and again to our shareholder uh, and the Abu Dhabi broader 2030 vision. Um, there is cost associated with it, but again, unless someone makes a big stance uh, and takes a stand on that, then others will not follow. So for us, it's an investment where we see the ROI, perhaps financially, perhaps not financially, but it's ultimately an investment that we're fully behind and will continue to do so. Great stuff. And I guess at some point, with the if the price of jet fuel continues going in the direction it is, sustainable aviation fuel will start to become more competitive. Um, I mean, I don't really follow the markets. I don't know how the trend is going to play out longer term, but that would be my very naive prediction. Do you think that's a reality for, for an airline like yours? I, I, 100%. Um, look, with the volatility that we're having in commodities uh, as a, in a broader context, and obviously with fuel and jet fuel in particular, if we go back in time, we was looking at four times um, the cost um, compared to uh, sustainable aviation fuel and you know jet fuel. If that continues and, um, and the, the gap shortens or reduces, then it will be more attractive for everybody. But again, unless as a broader sector, uh, unless of the production um, and the operators, i.e. the airlines, work together to make a, a much broader, bolder statement and stance, then price is only one element that we need to manage. Mm, absolutely. So just to kind of finish off, um, I'm running out of questions and you're a very fast talker, so we kind of raced through everything that I wanted to talk to you about. But sure. just tell me about your focus for the back end of the year. Obviously, we're in the summer holiday period in the this part of the world, at least. Um, but I know you guys have another holiday peak towards the end of the year. W what are your focuses to maintain that profitability through the rest of 2022? The rest of 2022, like the, the first eight months, is going to be extremely busy for us. Um, I mean, if we look at some of the uh, calendar events that we have around the corner, we have, in no particular order, we have the UFC here in our home in the Etihad Stadium in Abu Dhabi. We have, obviously, the Abu Dhabi and Etihad F1 towards the end of the year. Uh, in between that, we obviously have the World Cup for football fans. And just around the corner, we also have the, the Abu Dhabi Championship golf competition. So that's four of many. We have obviously an October school holiday break, which is extremely popular um, for many tourists around the world to visit Abu Dhabi. It's the great time of year in terms of climate, guaranteed sun, guaranteed first class service, both in terms of the hotels, but obviously us as an Etihad. So very much a continuation of what we have been doing uh, over the last eight months, which is focusing on, again, safety and security, the service, but again, at an appropriate cost base. So with that, and also planning for 2023 and beyond, will keep us extremely busy for the next four months. Busy time for you, Adam, absolutely. Uh, I really hope that we'll see a lovely flyover from you guys at the F1 again this year, because that was awesome last year with the, the 787. I'm betting it will be the A350 this year, but I guess I'll have to wait and see on that point. Um, Adam, thank you so much for joining Simple Flying. It's been awesome talking to you. I wish you all the best for the rest of the year. OK, thank you. Take care for now. Cheers. In addition to our daily YouTube videos, Simple Flying publishes over 150 articles every week. If you're looking for the latest aviation news and insights, visit simpleflying.com.